and um, the title still, the emphasis is still Jesus Perfect Theology, Part 11, and the subtitle um, is Truth Transcend, Transcends, and you'll see why, truth being Jesus, of course, and I didn't put up uh, Feeding on Jesus Part 2 Tuesday as a holiday, I'm going to do it tomorrow, and again, because they're going to go along with these Thursday nights. But I'm taking a little bit of a sidebar tonight, and then we'll get back on topic um, with the j feeding on Jesus, because I think it's um, where we're supposed to be at. Anyway, um, if you have your outline, and we're going to start off, and I'm going to—I wanted to do some quotes from this book, but there's just so many, and and um, but I'm, at least I'm going to—I'm going to tell you what this book is. It's called *Man in Christ* by James. Stewart, Stewart, middle name S-T-U-A-R-T, last name S-T-E-W-A-R-T. Yeah, so I don't know why they use two names the same, but anyway, um, this book was recommended years ago to me, and um, I just could never get past the first chapter because what he said, and I have mentioned this in the past, and it goes along with tonight, what James Stewart is saying here in Man in Christ is that Paul never ever when he was writing to these churches his epistles he never ever had a thought that this would one day be copied and duplicated down the, the down t through time and that it would be a Bible he never saw that as the case and in this book he goes through and lists that what the church has done, especially the Western church, has taken the writings of the Apostle Paul and has systematized it. Um, taking all the sidebars of Paul, and Paul is notorious for sidebars. He'll be talking and then he'll say something and go off to the side, but he'll come right back to Christ. And you'll see that in his writings. And what James Stewart is saying here is that Paul never ever wanted his writings to be systematized as the church has done to where we make everything about doctrine because when you make it about doctrine you completely miss out on what Paul is trying to say and he basically would say Paul would be out of his mind if he knew what we have done to his letters we think grabbing his letters and making theology out of it, doctrine out of it um, and not, not so much theology, theology is an understanding of God, you got to have that and um, to the point where you miss what he's saying. We'll develop that here today because I think that's why the Bible has become so hard to understand. I've, sometimes when I'm reading that and I'm reading, remember what, how, I, how did I end last Thursday? I said, this is so simple, somebody really smart and intelligent has to mess it up to make it complicated. One of Paul's fears was that, that like Eve in the garden, that we would be led astray from the simplicity of Christ. So there's a, this should be easy to understand, and it is, but we have really messed it up and done exactly what this writer is saying. So I recommend this book, even if you don't read beyond the first 21 pages. I always heard that it would, if, you buy, if, if you buy a book, if you get one good thought that just moves you, um, it was worth the price of the book and this is worth it. the first 21 pages is worth the price of this book because you'll see um, and one of the people like Carl Bart was really he really quotes a lot from Bart there in that 21 verses that thank God for people who recognized what we were doing to to Paul's writing systematizing it and and losing what Paul was really trying to convey so let me give you an example do you, do you realize, and this, Paul never ever was walking toward Corinth, and by the way, where do you think he did all his study at? He was on the mission field. He didn't have a house, he didn't have an office, he didn't have office hours. On the next way to his town, he's working this out in his mind, you know, praying and meditating. He doesn't have a school that he's going to. He doesn't have notebooks and books and YouTube and videos that he's watching throughout the week you know, accumulating all this. He's going, it's on the mission field. He's, de he's developing this by the Holy Spirit on the mission field. So, for instance, he didn't say, you know what, I think I'm going to teach on communion. 
That's what we think he did. When we go to the Bible, we look at what he wrote on communion, and then we're going to take what he says, and we're going to teach on communion. It never dawned on him to teach on communion. It wasn't on his to-do list to teach those guys on communion. Do you know why he taught on communion? Because they were getting drunk off of the wine and he had to, he, they, they were abusing it. Had they not been abusing it, you would have never had him talk about communion. How about spiritual gifts? You think that he's one day going, well, I, would, I really need to teach on spiritual gifts. Those nine spiritual gifts. No. If the Corinthian church wasn't abusing the spiritual gifts, he would never have to, he would never ride on it. And we wouldn't have nine spiritual gifts. Is this making sense? So you have to understand, this is, he's not, what am I going to teach you? I'm going to teach The stuff came out as they were developing who they were in Christ and how the church was supposed to come together. And so there were a lot of abuses, especially the Corinthians. And he wrote in view of the abuses, not because he felt like, I need to teach on this. Had they not been abusing the, th the, the different areas of, of church life, he would have never talked on it. So when you think about that, you're like, okay, that, that makes sense. Well, let me jump into this because um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. The general theme of Paul's work is, the, is Christ crucified, the finished work, however you want to look at that. His, the identity of a believer, our, our union in Christ, that's, and, I, and I challenged you, I don't know if it was Thursday or Sunday, I said, go there and see if you find him really preaching on anything else but the finished work, Christ. He said he wouldn't. When I'm among you, I determine nothing but Christ and crucified. So you're not going to get... He doesn't have an end-time theology. The Apostle Paul does not have an end-time theology. You know, so what happens is... And I'm going to give you some examples. For instance, the book of Revelation. We take that, and John is looking back. We take that book and look forward. Because when you, te when you teach on the book of Revelation right in my understanding as well as is a lot of them, is that every, all those chapters are metaphors and types and shadows, and they signify the finished work, his death, burial, and resurrection. What he did on earth, what's going on in heaven, as a result of what's going on in heaven, what's coming back down here on earth, the Babylonian system, the world system. It's, it's Christ on the white horse overcoming. He's um, not coming to overcome, but through the finished work, overcoming. And so when you look at the book of Revelation, you realize we're not looking forward to all these uh, Antichrist and rapture and all these things. Again, we, we, we take what John was trying to convey in several ways, his death, burial, and resurrection. Look what he did on earth. Look what he's doing in heaven. And as a result of what he did on earth and heaven, look what's happening on earth and all the hell that's going out. So in, in John's writing to the churches who are under that kind of um, they needed to hear that that um, style simply because that way of teaching because John's where on the island of Patmos? Why is he there? Is, it, well, is, he, is, there, is he there because of vacation? You got to know this. Why, did, why is he on the island of Patmos? Because he's preaching the gospel. And now while he's on the island of Patmos, he's writing seven letters to who? Church. Seven churches. What do you think he's going to do in those letters? Preach the gospel. Do you think because they put him there to stop preaching the gospel, and you think he's, they're going to let him write letters preaching the gospel? He knew that. So he used all the imagery of the Old Testament and put together the book of Revelation, and they looked at that and said, we don't, how, how are they going to understand it? We don't even know what he's talking about. He's nuts. Okay? So we read it, and we don't understand it, like they did it, but John's like, no, you do understand it. If you keep it about Jesus, his death, his burial, resurrection, what he did on earth, and what he's doing in heaven, and as a result on heaven, what's going on back down here on earth after his ascension, and what the church is going to go through, who the church is, it makes a lot of sense. And um, again, we make doctrines out of end times. They ask Jesus, when are you going to come back? Basically, to restore the, um, the kingdom to Israel, basically, when you're coming back, is what they're asking. He said, it ain't for you to know. But that ain't enough for the church. 
We gotta now predict when he's coming back, how he's coming back, when he's coming back, and we're gonna write books left behind, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, and we make a whole big deal about a simple thing, I'm coming back, but that ain't enough for us. We have to make doctrines out of that that confuses everybody and divides everybody. Post-trib, mid-trib, pre-trib, and we divide. And he's like, think about it, when are you coming back? He said nothing about post, pre, or mid. But we came up with that. And you go through all this, after a while you're going to be like, I'm done with this. This, this. this is why the church is in the state that it's in. And we keep doing it. Now I'm getting off on this, but that, that gives you an example. Now, I want you to see three fra- fa- phases that, um, that I came up with for me. They're not, they're not actual phases. That, that They're in the Bible, but I don't know if anybody's ever said there's three phases. But to me, I want to look at when Ephesians 1, 4, we were chosen in Him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, right? So phase one is being in Christ before the world. That's phase one, Okay. I don't know how long that goes. That's that's called eternity past. It has no beginning. So we were in Christ before the world began. So we were already in Christ. Already God did the eulogy. We did all, we talked about all that. And all the days of our life was written before we lived the very first one of them. You said to Jeremiah, I knew you before you was in your mother's womb. So there's a knowing of who we were before we actually came down here. So there's an existence here that nobody can understand. So we just leave it as mystery. Now what we want to do is we want to take this and get into reincarnation. Some have done that. That we existed in, 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 a, in another time, in another place. See, but you don't do Just stick with what Paul's saying. We were already chosen in Christ before the foundation world. That's phase that's that's one phase. The other one is and this and really I want to add to that in Christ for the foundation of the world up to up to Adam before the fall. Let me put that in there. So what we got is in Christ before the foundation of the world to Adam before the fall. So in Christ to Adam before the fall. Okay, right? You understand that? The second one is Adam after the fall to Christ. Okay? And here's the third phase. Christ being born, incarnation, resurrection, his death, burial, resurrection, ascension. Christ, all that finished work, the cross, we just put cross, that includes it all. Christ the cross to today. If you really want to simplify the Bible in faith, three phases, it's this. Now, where does all the confusion come in? You want to guess? Where does most of the, most of the, I mean, everything's confusing because everybody debates everything. But where does most of the confusion come from in church today? What phase? Now, this is my opinion. I, it's, it's purely subjective. Um, but what what phase? The first one. Okay, you say the first one? I say second. You say the second one? Do I got a third one? Somebody got a third one? You got a third one? You want to say a third one? <laughs> Anybody want to say a third one? Yeah. You, do you say a third one? Okay, you're all right, but where do you, where, where, for me personally, you know, studying like I do, where do I find all the debate and all the ugly and all the trash and chaos? It's right here. This one. So you know what? For instance, you got different atonement theories. You got diff- you got the Adamic nature. Do we have a sin nature? Do we not have a sin nature? Do we continue to have? Do we carry the Adam? What does it mean to be an Adam? What does it mean to be in Christ? Old Testament, which we went through for how many of these? That God is not that crazy God up there who's mean, who's bloodthirsty, who's out to steal, kill, and destroy everybody. You got now that, that includes the Old Testament. This would include the Old Testament from a- Adam's fall. To Christ would include the whole Old Testament. And you get a lot of stuff right there. A lot of debate. And the reason why I, I say this one is because what happens to us if we skip this phase? Forget it. 
Doesn't matter anyway, does it? I mean, however you see yourself in Adam, whether you were ever in Adam or whether you are in Adam, or what it means to be in Adam, whatever that even means, doesn't matter anymore because this one is the last Adam. Meaning, we're no longer in an Adam. We're in this last Adam, not this one. But however you look at it, even, even the devil, how much power you give him, how, how much you, what you think he is, even, even all of that, because you've got you to even put in the Gospels here too because it's up to Christ and the cross. There's some confusion there in the Gospels. But the thing is, no matter what you do with the devil, did he not defeat him? So you can sit there and debate spiritual warfare, you can debate demons, you can debate the devil, you can debate all the stuff that's in here. But once Christ is risen and we are the new man, which we talked about Sunday morning, this is all really coming, this, uh, they're all, all these messages are coming together. The new man, it doesn't matter then, this. And the books you read, it doesn't matter anymore where you stand here anymore because we're not in this realm anymore. Some will even argue you were never in Adam because from the, cross, the people that are born from the cross on are in Adam. So if I'm not in Adam, where am I at? I'm back over here. Isn't this what he came to restore? So personally, this was in a little bit of an awakening to me, not a major, but enough awakening to say, you know what, you guys can go ahead and debate this. I'm done. I'm out. I'm, I'm tapping out here. It doesn't matter if you want to discuss it and have fun playing around with it, but it really doesn't matter. What matters is I was in Christ before the foundation of the world, and whatever crap happened here, he comes and he restores. Um, do I have, what, do I have am, I, am I Acts? Yeah. Yeah, look at this. Acts 3, 21. Whom heaven, now this is Christ who ascends to heaven, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of a few things. Is that what it says? Mm -hmm. A few things? No. What's he restoring? Everything. So what you are debating here that we lost, that you want to call this the dark ages? I don't know what you want to call it. But it's, it's just... It's, it's, it's been restored back to pre-Adam. Pre-Adam, last Adam. No more Adam. Be done with it. Be do Don't even enter the debate. You're not in him. It's over. Even if you thought you were in him and, and, you, and you weren't, or you, or you never did think, it doesn't matter because you're not in him. You have the last Adam here now. So which means this. My identity is in Christ, not in what the Old Testament and everything that they were forging for. I'm not against the Old Testament because it all points to Jesus. But we're not, we're not um, mature enough to handle the Old Testament because look how many divisions we have divided. 40,000 40, different denominations? Yeah, that's, that's real unity. Um, so again, so where, where, my, where my focus is on these messages, especially Sunday morning and where we're going, we haven't even started on dominion. That, we just laid a foundation. Now we're going to start hitting some, some stuff um, starting this, this Sunday. But anyway, so my focus is the restoration of all things, which is he came to restore what he had in mind before the foundation of the world. That Adam lost when he ate from that tree. So now I, I go from here. This doesn't matter because Christ fixed it anyway, and here's where we are today, what he fixed. We're in the restoration of all things. Make sense? Now look at the next verse. This is old wine. This is what the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Hebrew, the Jews, the whole from, from Adam on to Christ, old wine. Now look what it says here. He spoke a parable to them, Jesus did. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Okay? So you don't take a new piece of garment and stick it on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear. And also, the piece that was taken out of, the, out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Now, Jesus is speaking here. What does he mean no one puts new wine into old wineskins? No one's going to take this, what he did on the cross, called new, and... Try to stick it in 
this phase. This is the old. We're, going, we're coming into the new. This is the new covenant. This is the old covenant. No one's, no one's going to take the, the new wine, the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of Paul, and dump it into this. It won't, it won't work. You'll tear it. Then what's he say here? Or else the new wine will burst the wineskins from the gases and everything, being new, and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. Next. But new wine, new wine, must be put into new wineskins, meaning new man, not the old man. This is the old man. Because of what Adam did, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the system of the world was developed after that. So we got the old man here, we got the new man, and Jesus saying what I'm saying and doing, which Paul picks up and he says is new wine, and you, you can only put new wine... What Jesus did, the cross, Paul says, Christ and him crucified, that's new wine, into new wine skins, which is the new man. The new you, a new creation. Now watch. But new wine must be put into new wine skins. And both are preserved. And no one, now look at this, look at verse 39. And no one, having drunk old wine, in other words, this is where I live. I, this is where I move and have my being in the Old Testament. I even have an Old Testament mindset in the New Testament. Because of the, put the new cloth on old cloth. Now watch. No one having drunk old wine immediately desires new. For he says, the old is better. So Jesus knew that they, they would have a hard time transitioning from the old into the new wine. Old wine into new wine. So I'm saying this new wine is straight from the throne room of God bypassing this phase. And this is where we, to me personally, this is where we need to focus on. Who we were in Christ before the foundation of the world and who he restored us to be is who we've always been. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to get, in, in, you want to stay here and debate all that. I, I, I see people do it every day on Facebook. On YouTube, they keep regurgitating the same old, same old, and we never can get on to the new man and new creation realities, which is the dominion message. It's, it's the doing the Father's business. It's, it's doing signs and wonders, the greater works. It's being the, the, the new man that is created after Christ Jesus, as he is, so are we in this world. It, we, we, we never can go on to the new because we get stuck debating all of this, which really doesn't matter anymore. This is what matters. This is the day you will know that I am in you. You are in me. I'm in the Father. The Father's in me. And from that point on, you're going to move in power. You're going to move in signs and wonders. You're going to have dominion like you never knew it. Church isn't, you know, why is church stuck here? The church, the, the church is it, completely ignorant of this mystery. This is where they camp out it and bring, and bring this and this together and just mess it all up, confuse it all and then, you know, you throw in the book of Revelation here and really mess the whole, the whole thing up of who we are and where we're going. Now, um, so they desire the old better. And that's the problem in the church. You can't get people to move into new wine of what Jesus is doing or what he did because they're stuck on old man realities. They're stuck in Adam. They're stuck in the Old Testament, a God of judgment, a God of chaos. And they can't move on to bigger and better things. And I'm going to show you that is Paul's desire. I'm going to show you the scriptures here in a minute to show you that. So with these three phases, here's where we focus. This one here, can't focus on because he fixed everything here. So we go from here to here. Okay, just so you know that. Now, when I say truth transcends, what do I mean by that? Everybody starts their journey. Every one of us starts our journey believing something about God. Doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. You, before, you went, before you started going to church, you had some type of a concept of God, and you called that truth. Why? Because that's what you believe. Then you get to church and find out, ooh, that's wrong. Because you didn't know any better. You may have heard it from TV, or you may have heard somebody say something, and you had that. You come to church, the pastor opens up the Bible, and you, you say something, you go, oh my God, I never knew that. I didn't know that was in there. I was wrong. But do you think that stopped God from working in your life and moving in your life because you started off with a bad understanding of who He was? 
What I'm trying to get you to see is every one of us has a truth that we start off with. Depending upon the church you go to, they're going to give you their brand of that truth. And then you're going to find out if you venture out of your church onto YouTube or Facebook or some social media platform or Christian television, you're going to find out that these people believe differently than your pastor that you presently you, that you went to church at. And then you're going to listen to these guys. You're going to go, oh, I think, he, I think my, pastor's, my pastor may be wrong. So you change again. But did that having that wrong understanding keep God from moving and working in your life? No. That's, that's obvious. No. What I want you to see is how important is the present truth you're holding on to right now. How important is it? You say, it's really important. Well, in five years from now, you probably won't believe a lot of it. So, well, I don't believe it anymore. Well, then it must not have been that important if you, if, if you don't believe it anymore. Now, there's some truths you hold on to. They're found, they're orthodox. You hold on to them because incarnation, Jesus being God, that whole thing. You hold on to those. But a lot of this stuff is that peripheral that changes a lot. I believe it, I don't, I do, I don't, I believe this and I don't, now I believe that, you're all over the place. But the core, Christ himself, the Trinity, the Incarnation, the um, Christology, the Trinitarianism, all that grace, you still believe all that. But it, it, all this other stuff will change in and out your whole journey. So that's why I was saying don't hold tightly to these doctrines or theories, whatever you want to call them, because they will always change as your understanding of God changes. And so you, then we don't divide. If, if you have that mentality, you won't divide. You'll say, well, either you're wrong or I'm wrong, or we're both wrong, and there's another truth neither one of us can see. But, hey, I could be, and, and I think if everybody takes intellectual humility, which means I could be wrong, we won't divide. Because we say, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't get that. I don't see it like you do. But, hey, it's about Jesus. You pull it right back to Jesus. This is what Paul did in, in his epistles. He made it about Jesus and then took a little sidebar, not long enough to develop a theory or a doctrine out of it, but enough just to say, hey, he had to, and then he went right back into it. I'll show you how that works out here in a minute. Now, truth, so what I'm saying, truth transcends. Now, I, I had this little conversation with God. I wasn't going to say it, but I'm going to. I had this little conversation with God this week. I said, God, whose fault is it? that I started my journey off not knowing anything? Is that my fault? Because before I was awakened to who I was in Christ, before the Holy Spirit, no man come unto the Father, the Spirit draws him, um, I was blind. I was in darkness. So can I be blamed for being in darkness? You could have put that Bible in front of me, and I'm like, number one, I don't have a desire to read it. But who, is that my fault? You can say that it's your fault, but I don't know because watch where I'm going to go with this. Put a pause on that. Okay, now that I'm in church, whose fault was it that I may have been led to the wrong church? That's legalistic, that's just, you're, you're not going to learn anything and you're there for 10 years. Fellowship's great. You, learn, you, you got to love on people. People loved you. But learning God... No way. You, you had to leave that church to learn. So whose fault was that that you went to the wrong church? Whose fault is that? You can't blame me for that. Because I didn't have any understanding of any churches. Of who was right, who was wrong. I only went to this church because I had a friend that went to that church. And I needed to go to church. So I trusted him and his dad. And then when I went to this church, I trusted the leaders. Is that my fault because I'm, I didn't know what church was right, what church was wrong? Did, did God go, dang, go ahead, I got you born again, you seen the kingdom, and you went off to the wrong church? I never heard him say that was the wrong church. And if he wanted me to go to another church, why not lead somebody else into my life to lead me to that church? See where I'm going with this? So what happens now that I'm in that church? So I leave that church, I go to another church. And I'm still not getting the truth. The Western mindset just has me still legalistic, whatever, and, and so forth and so on. What I'm trying to say, and again, maybe I can't articulate it the way that I'm telling God, but hope, hopefully you'll get this. I said, God, you can't blame me 
right even to this day, you cannot blame me that if you have Stevie put a book in my hand and say, read this, and I'm, guy, I'm saying, I don't understand a word this guy is saying. I don't have a high IQ to understand what this guy is saying. This is going over my head. But you want me to read it? I don't get it. I, how am I supposed to... Whose fault is that? That I can't comprehend what's in this book. Whose fault is that? Ain't mine. Because I can find books I can understand. So I can go to, to, to read a book or listen to a message. And if the Holy Spirit in me is not opening my eyes to understanding what is in front of me, it ain't my fault. You know how liberating that was for me to go, wow. Because there's a lot of stuff I don't understand. I scratch my head and go, you know what, guys, go ahead and debate it, because I, I, I see where you guys are coming from, but I don't, I, I don't know. I have no clue. Is God okay with that? Do we have to under... See, what they've done to the Apostle Paul, and I think Karl Barth said this, is that they, the Western mindset, has, cannot have any loose ends in Paul's theology. No loose ends. Everything has to line up and make sense. No mystery. No like, well, his ways are past finding out. The minute you understand God, he ceases to be God. And only God can talk about God. Let that sink in. Only So I can't talk about God. Only the Holy Spirit in me, moving through me, can talk about God. Isn't that what the Spirit, Jesus said? The Spirit will lead and guide you into all truth. He will, he will speak and show you things. So what, what He shows, what the Holy Spirit tells me, I tell you, but that's not me. It's what I heard the Spirit or I saw the Spirit show me. Only God really can talk about God and that's why you need the Holy Spirit. And we just didn't... You know what we were all... All of us. There ain't, there ain't a person here that found the perfect church, the perfect theology, and got it right right off the bat. Nobody. That, that animal doesn't exist. We all are groping around looking for truth. And some churches have a little bit. Some churches have a little bit more. But we keep... The journey is that truth transcends, as the title is. Jesus, once you think you understand Jesus... He will come and show you a revelation that transcends that past truth. Now, what do I mean by that? Jesus said, you've heard it said, everything they've learned here. He comes along here and says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. He's transcending the truth they knew to a higher truth. Think of a ladder, the rungs in the ladder. You started off believing something. Whether it's right or wrong, you started off believing something. Then as you, your journey, being the latter journey, you're journeying up, you're journeying closer to God, however you want to see that. But every rung in the ladder is a truth, and then the next transcends that truth, because you can never ever get to the top, because to understand God is to get to the top, and that'll never happen. Otherwise, he ceases to be God if you, can, if you know him. He's no longer majestic. His ways become finding out. And you just can't do that. that. You may get that on the other end. But in this life, we're on a journey. And every present truth you think is true, but hold on, he will transcend that truth. May, it may stay a little bit the same, but you, now you know it even better. And you won't even talk about that truth the same way. You may not have changed a lot. But the next revelation of that truth, the more you see it more clearly, changes your language. You won't even talk like you did about that truth. Is this making sense? This is the journey we're on. And when you find churches that say, this is what we believe, and if you don't believe like us, there's the door, well, you need to go. Because they're stuck. They are stuck. I know I have friends that are stuck. They won't move on to the new man. And I'm telling you, I think we, I think the church, I, I've always believed since the, not, the late 80s in a glorious church, a powerful church, a church on the cutting edge. I'm telling you, if the church would be the church of Acts, we would be a force to be reckoned with on earth. And we wouldn't need the programs and all the little cute things that we do. You wouldn't be worried about all the little 
things tweaking we're doing about the building and the church, if you had the glory of God, if every day the pastor's having dreams and visions and he's getting revelations, he's got no time to play a self-help thing going on. You know, He's got no time to play with programs. He's got no time to even strategize for the new year. He can't keep up with the glory and the move of God. But because we have... Because... Um, the glory of the Lord is departed. What is that word? Ichabod. Hey, he's departed. Do you know where I feel like I'm at right now? I feel like Moses. I want to say, guys, there is no glory on all this talking that we're doing. We're regurgitating doctrine. You got you, You're going to say your take. You're going to say your take. And I feel like Ichabod. The glory is departed. And I feel like Moses. I want to pitch my tent. This is how I feel right now. I want to pitch my tent outside the church. Because the glory has moved. And we're stuck in doctrine. You know, we're, we're stuck in debating what church is supposed to look like. Paul says, I mean, let me tell you how we do this. Paul says, one will come with a teaching. One will come with a song. One will come with instructions. One will come with a revelation. And in that koinonia, we fellowship. That's it. Leave it alone. No, man, we got to get in and tell you exactly how. We got to add so much more. And we lose the very little few things he says it should be about. We're not even doing because we've got the glitz, the glamour, the Madison Avenue techniques. We got, we got the church looking like a, a bar, a nightclub. How did we move from a simple, one comes with a hymn, one comes with a revelation, one comes with a testimony, one comes here, and then we fellowship. What's, and then Paul says that the five-fold ministry, watch how this works, the five-fold ministry is to equip the saints for the work of service. Rather than do that, we debate on what the five-fold ministry is, whether it exists or not, what's a prophet. And then we write thousands of, he's not telling you that. See what? He says a five-fold ministry, equip the saints for the work of service, and rather than do that, we take a side, we take that little sidebar, and now we're going to talk about what an apostle is. And then we're going to talk about whether they, they existed there or not, and what it is, and who's one, who's not. Then we're going to do it the, 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 the prophet the same way. We take off on the fivefold ministry, then rather do what he said they're supposed to do, equip the saints for the work of service. Because the saints aren't doing the work of service. The saints are spectators to the professionals on stage. Not doing. One comes with a hymn. One comes with a revelation. Not even doing that. And then Paul's in Ephesians goes on and says, we are wrestling against principalities and powers. So put on the armor. You know what we do? We write a huge, all kinds of stuff on what the armor is. When he's simply saying, who is the armor? Jesus. He's Je And no, but no, we're not, it's not Jesus. The armor's not Jesus. And we go and take off on the armor. And Paul would be like, oh my God, come back. Get back to Jesus here. What are you taking off on the armor for? And then you're, and you're giving devil the more power than what he really has. You've taken off on the devil. You've taken off on the armor. You've gone on this spiritual warfare tangent. And you've completely missed your victory. Because you took off on all these doctrines. You've made more than what Paul is trying to convey. And, and, it's just, and, and you, you go through and you'll see we do this. And we continue doing this. And all it does is just create smoke and mirrors. We never really get to do the work. Because we're, 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 we got, we're anchored into this division and doctrines. And we never really see who we are. This making sense? Yeah. So, Paul says, or Jesus goes on to say, In that day you will know that I'm in the Father, the Father is in you. So they didn't know that. They're going to grow in, they're going to transcend what in fact the disciples are going to transcend Jesus from the flesh to the spirit. Think about that. Where Paul says, we don't even know Jesus after the flesh anymore. That means that we're we we have transcended. Paul, not so much Paul, but the disciples knew Jesus for that three and a half years in the flesh. And Paul says we don't even we don't even know him after the flesh anymore because he transcended to the spirit. And now we know him after the spirit. We don't and he says we determine to know man after the flesh anymore because once you're born again and you see the kingdom, you've just transcended out of your illusion into the new creation. 
Now you're different. And the church won't let us see ourselves being different. They drag us from what Christ called us to be, raised us to, and drag us back into the old man mentality. And God doesn't do that anymore. Not you, not yet. This is just hold on to, to the fort till Jesus comes back. We, we, we just, this, this thing's never going to change. The earth is going to hell in a handbasket. Where's the glorious message, the glorious church message? Where's the greater works being done? No. Because we've got bogged down into religion. Everything I'm saying to you is religiosity. It's religion. There's no life in it, and you don't know who you are from it. And you can't accomplish anything within it. So then he, he, Jesus says to them, there are many more things I want to say to you. I'm getting ready to leave. I have three and a half years. I have, I got so many, it's like, it's like if I say, guys, it's, it's eight o'clock. I got a whole lot more. But we're going to have to close it out. I'm okay closing it out. I'm okay you knowing what I went through today, tonight. We'll pick it up down the road. That's what Jesus, he says, hey, I'm leaving. And there's more things I'd like to say to you, but you're not ready anyway. So we're going to hold off on those things. And Jesus, now listen to this. I'm just trying to deliver us from the bondage of doctrine. Because it's robbing us of life. Amen. And that is, Jesus says, I'm okay you not knowing what somebody else knows. I'm okay that you may not ever know what your pastor knows. I'm okay that you never get a degree in college, Bible college, seminary. I'm okay with that. I can still, you can still turn the world upside down with me with what you presently know. You know enough to turn the world upside down. Do you know that? Do you believe that? We don't believe that because the church keeps telling us, not you, not yet. You need to know more. So keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. And so you come as a student, but you never grow to be a master. You never grow to go out and do the things. Paul says you ought to be teachers by now, but you're still students. Because the church won't graduate you. So the, disciple, the, the, the trained religious men said regarding the disciples, these are untrained men. And they turned the world upside down. You find that in Acts. It says that. And they were just amazed. These guys didn't go to school. And yet how are they doing what they're doing? And they noticed that these men, what? Come on. Remember that? Remember the scripture? These men had been with Jesus. That's all you need. You just need to be, have your eyes open to Jesus, Christ in you, the hope of glory, and you can take the little that you know and turn the world upside down by letting the Holy Spirit just move through you and speak to you. You don't need to know all this That's stuff. It. That's it. You don't need it. And we are just bogged down. So then Paul goes on, picks up where Jesus left off. He says, many things I want to say that you're not able to handle it. Paul picks up and says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. All that still waits for you to understand who you are and what he did. That's here. That's here. The new man. The new creation. We haven't even closely tapped... Because I'm telling you that, that if you believe the new creation, and you believe what John said, as he is, so are we in this world, you would never settle for limitation. We are all about, I'm limited. I got limited funds. I got limited health. I got limited knowledge. I got limited this. I got limited opportunity. I got limited. And we always see limitation. He removed limitation. When, he, when you died and he died and you rose, you rose to unlimitedness. You're in Him. He's in you. That's unlimited. That means all things are possible. But they, they want to keep, like I said Sunday, the crabs. You put a bunch of crabs in a bucket, and you can walk away. Why is that? You don't need to put a, I mean, I just, I just bought these crabs, or I just caught these crabs. And I got, them in the, I, I, I got to go over here. I don't want to lose these crabs I just bought, so I got to do something. No, you don't. No, you don't. Just walk away. They, they will all make sure no one escapes to the new man reality. They'll stay in this bucket that we've been delivered from. They'll keep, and that's what religion's doing. And we've got to say, enough. Enough. We've got to be like Moses. I'm pitching my tent outside the camp. I'm not doing this anymore, guys. I've sat here and watched you all just keep doing what you're doing, and no one is changing anything. 
you're just talking doctrine. And I've had it. I, I can't, I personally can't do it anymore. Because that's all I see, doctrine, doctrine. I don't see life. I don't see people feeding on Jesus. I see them feeding me doctrine. Okay? So then Paul goes, seen ears not heard. Now Ephesians 1 says, do I have that one? Is that the next one anyway? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Because this is the only way. So I say, it's not my... He knows. He's not going to blame me for not knowing. That's why he gave me the spirit. Because he knows you don't know. You can't know. It's never, your, it's never been your fault that you didn't know. That's why he gave the Holy Spirit. Because the natural man cannot ascertain the things of the spirit. And being a natural man, you could never know truth. That's why, I, I don't know, maybe I, I may be the only one who carried that guilt. I need no more, I need no more, I need no more. And I wasn't understanding by the churches I was in, the people I was around, but I didn't have a path to the, the, you know, to the exact truth. I'm groping like everybody else trying to find truth. And, and, and the truth is in the Spirit. So the Spirit opens my eyes and gives me revelation and wisdom to the eyes of our understanding being enlightened that you may know what the hope of His calling. Do we even know what the hope of His calling is? What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? But that's, what, that's where we're going to have our eyes open to what He accomplished. And, and the sky, I hate to say that, the sky's the limit, but it's unlimited. The minute you become limited, God's limited. The Bible says that God is all and in all. So that, watch this. Where's my chalk? I don't want chalk. What? Do you want to see my chalk? All right. So watch this. I need another board. So if here, here's God, and He's all, and everybody is in God, because God is all and in all. So that means we orbit, if you want to use that, around God, and God, working Himself. God, we know this. In that day, you know that I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me, and I'm in you, and you're in me. God's working Himself. In you, through you, for others. On earth, as it is in heaven. That is huge. God is in you, working Him through you on this earth. And do you see those works being displayed? No, you see us with our noses in the book, reading that doctrine for the 15th time trying to understand jaw-breaking terms man has come up with good I, I've shared some of these terms with you they're not biblical they're not in the Bible but man came up and it means this man come up with that means that and you can't even pronounce them they come from a Greek word it's transliterated in English this and Paul is like you know we're not we're not going to get into a systematizing this thing it's about a person and we're taking all this from a person. Watch where this goes. I, I, I'm, I'm just, I gotta hurry up here because I'm, I'm running out of time. So, um, the example. So let's say you go to a cooking class. Okay, you wanna learn how to cook. You paid for it and this guy's gonna teach you how to cook and he is doing some amazing things. And you're looking at a man taking notes, you know, like, I want, I, it's, about, it's about the meal. So to, tonight you showed up and you're gonna learn how to do something. Okay, and we're, we're going to go to Brenda's and we're going to learn how to make meatballs. Okay, so we're all excited. We're going over there and she's the teacher and we're going to, and just, she says, oh yeah, by the way, watch the grease. It, you could start a grease fire. And then she goes right back into showing you how to do the, the meatballs. And all of a sudden, all of us start talking about, what, grease fire? And then we're off on grease fire. And then we talk about, well, what do we do? do you, how do you get a grease fire out? Well, you can't put water. She's still cooking. She's sh she's, maybe she has a few students listening, but we all came over here. We're like, well, what do you do with a grease fire? How do you put a grease fire out? I heard you can't use water. Well, you got to have a fire extinguisher. you got to have a fire extinguisher? Yeah, you got to have a fire extinguisher. What kind of fire extinguisher? you got to make sure it's got its proper date. And then it says, well, what happens if we get burnt by that grease fire? Well, you got to go to the hospital. You got to get a bandage. What kind of bandage? How long? Is it? The bandage got to be on at least four or five days. You don't want to get infected. You get infected. We are complete. This is what we did to Paul's writings. He just took a little sidebar 
And then went right back to Jesus, and we went off on this thing, and then another generation went off on it, and, and we're all confused. And, it's, and we forgot about the meal. I see this every day from educated people who should know better, and we're not, we're not there. We, we can't get back to Christ. And it makes me think, maybe because no one's really even sitting at the feet of Christ, hearing the Holy Spirit, because they're just quoting book knowledge. I can't do it. There's no life in that. It's, it's becoming the letter, the letter of the law, you know what that is, but could there be the letter of doctrines? The kill? Because there's no life in it. Remember I said last week, how, how, how is learning the, the book of Revelation going to deliver you from a bad marriage? How, how's it going to help you personally? How, how are you going to be transformed by knowing doctrine? You're transformed by knowing the person. Sitting there knowing the person. Untrained, but people noticing you've spent time with Jesus. And then you start seeing your life being revolutionized. Not by doctrine, but by hearing Him, by spending time with Him, and not getting, your, you know, spending time with the Spirit, having the eyes of your understanding open. Have you ever noticed that the more we learn, the more we divide? And you know what, type, what, what area of church we don't divide over? Worship. I mean, I'm not talking about style. Hey, you can divide over style. Well, we want drums, we don't want drums. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying when you have a congregation who has a, mil a plethora of beliefs, and they don't all, all believe the same, right? And, and if you start talking about those different beliefs, things can get hot, at least uncomfortable. Maybe a few leave. So we just won't go there. But what when we start worshiping, we're all, uni we're all united. We're unified. That, you never ever see people getting to a knockdown, drag out fight during worship. But I've heard some horror stories when a guy's up here teaching, people get mad, say things. Malcolm said the other day that um, he, he, he's been mocked several times from people in the congregation by what he's saying in his earlier years. And that's Charles Stanley, got, some guy came up and slapped him in the face. I mean, you, you, I've heard some horror stories because people get so angry with what you believe. But when you get to a worship service, you don't have that. You know why? Because we're all focused on Jesus. But then when the worship is over and the pastor gets up and opens up that Bible, now the trouble begins. Now the division happens. Right? Come on. And you leave, I, well, I, I, I was with him up to this point. I can't go there. I can't go. And you, it's, I ruined your day. We just should have stayed in worship. And everybody would have been happy. I shouldn't ruin your day. I don't care what I say. It should just make you go, huh. Never thought about that. I don't agree with it. But it doesn't mean that it's wrong. Maybe I just don't have eyes to see. Or maybe he's wrong and the Lord will fix that down the road. But it's not hurting anything. Because it's still... I'm not asking you to drink Kool-Aid. I'm not talking about that. I may venture off a little bit like, I don't know about that. That's okay. I don't know if I even agree with it. But we've got to stretch. We've got to break out of the box somewhere. And I'll tell you, I don't know if I agree with this or not, but this is what's being said. I'm intrigued by it. I don't know if I believe it, but I'm trying to get out of that crab bucket, people. I want out. I want to experience life and have it more abundantly. Okay? All right, let's close with this. Uh, Hebrews, is that what's next? Look what Paul says here. Therefore, leaving. Leaving. Put it behind us. The discussion of elementary principles of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. Let's get out of the bucket. Okay? Let's get out of this. This, this debating of who, all these theories. Let's get into the reality of what he did on the cross. That I'm in and he's in me. He says, let's, let's, let's go on. Let's move on to perfection. Not laying again foundational teachings. 
doctrines. Let's not keep laying down the same doctrine over and over and over and over and over again. We get it. Now, if you don't understand incarnation, you need that laid down in your life. You need that. And periodically, you want to go back and renew your mind on it. But you've got to move from it. Okay? And he's not exhausting the list of doctrines here. He's just giving you some here. He says, we're going to lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrines of baptism or the laying on of hands or the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. Man, we wrote books on this. When he told us to move on, we're still writing books. Move on to what? Perfection. What the heck is that? The, what I say, was it Sunday? Or last, that we are forever perfected by one sacrifice. We're complete in Him. And you aren't living a perfected life. You're not living a complete life. We're nowhere near it. Are you walking in power and glory? He says, let's move on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of all these doctrines. You, you see that there. He even told them that you should be teachers by now. He said, i got to come back and teach you all over again. And this is what we do. We just keep teaching each other all over again the same stuff that has been taught for generations. Now, if you don't know them, then yes, learn them. But once you have it, don't you think you need to move on? Or do you got to go back and talk them over again? Let's go around the mountain of atonement theory again. Let's go around the mountain of an Adam, all die. Let's go around the Adamic nature out, uh, um, mountain again. It's like a broken record. I don't care where you end up on that. Because the fact is, I'm not that anymore. That's why I, just, I leave these debates to those people that want to debate it. Because even though no matter where you end up, we're not that anymore anyway. There's a lot of doctrines like that. That being in Christ, it's a moot point. Alright? Alright, so... We'll skip. I have the John. Let's skip all those John's scriptures about the works. Because um, I hit those on Sunday morning. Um, let's go to Hebrews 6 5 and close it out. <clears> that <throat> might be the next to the last scripture. Okay. Now watch this. Now he's talking about. People that have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Now, I'm going to lift this out of context. There's no sense I'm, the context doesn't matter right now. It's not the point. I'm going to lift this out of the context. And I want you to see this little piece he, got, he put here. Tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. What does he mean by that? Well, look, look what the, the message translation says. Once people have seen the light, gotten a taste of heaven and been part of the work of the Holy Spirit. Once they've personally experienced the sheer goodness of God's Word and the powers breaking in on us. I don't know what the age to come, I don't know what he means by the age to come, but even if it's the age of when Jesus comes back and everything's perfect, we, he's, he's saying you could have that now. Whatever that age is, it's, it's the goodness of God and the power of God. And we should be tasting that. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And the Holy Spirit's been given to us in power. Where is the power of God? We've got His goodness. So where is the power to back up the goodness that He wants us? Jesus went about doing good. He came to For this very reason, He came to destroy the works of the devil with good works. So where's the power, where's the goodness? But I'm telling you, there is, there is an experience that we have not tapped into on this end, that started in, on this end. I mean, think about what he created you to be before the foundation of the world, that you're going to come down here. Now, when he created earth, he was sinking heaven and earth together. I don't think Adam saw a distinction. I don't think Adam was... Had a, had a distinction, heaven's up there, I'm down. I think God is heaven, who walked this earth with Adam, and there was no, no separation. He didn't, he didn't sense separation. Now, he wasn't in God, in the Godhead per se, although he was before the foundation of the world, but Christ is going to come to make that happen. 
that we're in the Godhead. The Godhead's in us. But I think that once that that man, man separated from God when he went to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And therefore, the, in their mind, they separated heaven and earth. In their mind, the separation happened. God did not separate from them. They're the ones running from God. Were they looking? Did, did they eat from the tree and went looking for God? Where's he at? He's, he's, he should be here. It's 5 o'clock. He's not here. Every day he's here at 5 o'clock to, to commune with us. You think it's could we eat from that tree? It could be. He said if we, he's mad at us. Is that what happened? No. They ran from him. They separated from him. They created the separation. Jesus comes back to sink heaven and earth back in our minds and in reality of those in darkness. So we're here to bring heaven back to earth. Now what is that supposed to look like? Not what we're going through. Now I'm going to close with this. In 1996, I was pastor in a large church. You know this. I sat behind that desk. And the reason I'm telling you where I'm, where I'm at now. I sat behind that desk and I said, this is not what church is supposed to look like. I think I shared this two Sundays ago. I said, this isn't what church is supposed to look like. I'm done. I, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. And I hit a wall. I mean, I, and I hit a wall not just in that, but in my whole life it seemed like it was built on an illusion because not, it, was all, it was all built on religion, especially church. But I was done with church. And I said, I, I don't care to ever do this again. In fact, when I walked away, I was never coming back to be a pastor again because I, I, I tasted, I tasted that. And I, I don't want it. That, t that was horrible. You couldn't get me. If, 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 if somebody said, hey, you want to come and pastor a church of 1,000, 10,000, I'm like, you, are you serious? I've been there. I, I, that, that's, that's not, I'm sorry, that this is my opinion. I'll make people mad. I'll lose friends over this. I already have on Facebook that p uh, pastors have big churches. They don't like what I say. But that's not, can I be honest? We got time, can I be honest? How many people can I effectively reach one guy? That I know your kids' names, or I know what's going on in your life personally. I know where you live. I know how 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 how, how can that how can that work out when I, when you got a thousand people in the church? Hey, we had a hundred people visit. I don't I, I don't do, I only say because I didn't see them. I didn't even meet them, but I was told there was about a hundred visitors today. And you're gonna you're gonna brag over that? You didn't even meet them. So why do you want them there? You're not gonna. You're not gonna disciple them. You're not gonna look at them eyeball to eyeball. You don't. Well, you won't even go visit them in the hospital. You got a guy that you hired to go do that. Come on. No, they say uh, one guy can effectively, effectively reach a be be a, an effective pastor to fifty to a hundred, and that's even pushing it. He'll need somebody to help him. So what happens if my church grows to about five hundred? Well, am I supposed to be raising leaders? Yeah. And I guarantee you, they're itching to preach. They're itching to be in the ministry. Well, I've got 300 right here. Take them and go over on the other side of town. And we'll, we'll help you build the building. We'll, and then you are autonomous. You're on your own. I split the church. You don't see that, do you? Oh, no. We want them all for ourselves. And all these people you're training never get to get their feet wet. So why are they there? We're not doing it right. One guy cannot effectively. So I saw all this. I said, I'm a CEO of a big business, and that is not how God wants it to be. Now, I say all that to say this. I am at another crucible today, like I was in 96. And I am Moses, and I want to tell you right now, I am pitching my tent outside the camp of church. Not leaving church, just traditional church, the religious church. And all these doctrines and all this crap that's not taking us anywhere, ain't changing nobody's life. We still got the same addictions we've had for 20 years. Now on our, we're on our third marriage. We're on our fifth bankruptcy. I mean, we are a mess. But we know doctrine. Hmm? Nobody's, no, no, nobody's getting healed. Nobody's getting delivered. We're not seeing any signs and wonders, but we got books that you're to read. We've got classes for you to take. My God, I'm pitching my tent out. The glory's left. I, 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 you may not recognize it. There's no life on what we're doing as a church. 
and the message ain't going to be about this anymore. You know, like I said, Paul says, we'll do this if it's necessary. But it's not necessary. So we're moving on. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. That's the only reason why I, 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 I'm a little happy my stuff's on Facebook or on YouTube. Because if somebody new comes, I can say, here's a playlist on the New Covenant. Watch it. Because I may not hit New Covenant for another two, three years and only brush up against it because we've been there, done that. Why go back and rehash it all over again? What did we say when we came here on Thursday nights? Start from the beginning. Start from the beginning. For people who may not have known because we, we didn't know each other. Some of you knew each other. But we said, let's just start from the beginning. Okay, I can't go back and do this again. I, I even thought about, man, could I go back and teach on the New Covenant? Are you kidding me? I, it's not in me to do that because I'm chomping at the bits to go into the glory realm, to spirit realm, where the glory is that manifests on earth as it is in heaven. I want, and let's go to that next last one. This is where I want to go. This is the stuff I want to do. Last verse. For the earnest expectation of the creation waited for. In other words, creation. The law, every, people are waiting. What, for, an, for another iPhone? What are we waiting for? Manifestation of the sons of God. And we have not been manifesting anything. We're, we look just like everybody else with the same problems. We're in the bucket with the rest of the crabs. Nobody's leaving this. Moses was the crab and said, I'm pitching my tent outside because the glory's not here. It moved. God moved the glory outside the camp and nobody recognized it but one man. Do we even have discernment to recognize, hey, we've been having church for 10 years and the glory hasn't been here in the last 10 years. That's why we've got the programs. That's why we got the Madison Avenue techniques. That's why we got the big building, the good building, the good looking building, the big building, the paid parking lot, all the programs because we can't get people here. We got to give free stuff away to get them here. Admit that the glory has departed and you got to reduce it down to carnal ways and means. When we should be operating in a spirit realm that's shaking this earth with heaven. And that's where we're going on yeah. Sunday mornings. I'm and, going with you. <laughs> yeah. and if I don't go, then you I'm pass me up. I'm going with you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Hebrews 13. Do not be carried about with strange and various doctrines. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Four verses down. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp. Mm. <laughs> Let's look at that. That's good. Where's it at? Hebrews 13, 9. I got to see that. And 13. <coughs> I totally forgot. Man, that's that's good. Thirteen what? Nine. Thirteen. Where am I? Twelve. Thirteen. Now you started at nine? Nine and then verse thirteen. Nine and jump to thirteen? Yes. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods through which those who were thus occupied were not benefited. Hence, let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Hmm. Outside, yeah, that's good. We are seeking a city which is to come. Hmm. I have to look at that. But that's right, that's good. Read it. Yeah, you have it? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Don't be lured away from him by the latest speculations about him. The grace of Christ is the only good ground for life. Products named after Christ don't seem to do much for those who buy them. And then let's go outside where Jesus is, where the action is. Not trying to be privileged insiders, but taking our share in the abuse of Jesus. The insider world is not our home. Mm. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and again, I'm not being critical of sound doctrine. But I am being critical that we don't move beyond it. Yeah. Anything else? The Lord spoke to me this past week um, to stop. I mean, He just told me, stop looking for me in the doctrine, in what the, the church is saying, in the schooling 
I can teach you and speak to you in anything in this life because he is everything. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's good. Good stuff. Good stuff. Amen. Father, we bless you. And Lord, we know that God, you are God, that you are in all. You are all. It's all about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you've placed us in the realm of the triune God. We are one with you. And you are working in us and through us to present your glory on earth. Yes. To present your goodness on earth. Your goodness, your glory displayed in your power. And Father, we get to co-create with you. We get to turn this world upside down with you. Open our eyes and make us ready vessels. As Isaiah said, Lord, here am I. Send me. And we're going with you, not apart from you. Even Moses said, Lord, if you don't go with us, we don't want to go. We don't want to go. So we're going to follow the glory. We're going to follow the cloud. What is God doing? Am I, am I willing to go with him? What is God doing? Where is he at? What's he working? What's he doing? And Lord, am I willing to go with you? And I hope that answer is yes. By your grace it will be. That we will walk with you and will go with you in all that you're accomplishing on earth from heaven. That we may manifest as the sons of God. Give us the understanding to know what that means to be in you, one with you, a son with you, being about your business on earth. Amen.